Hey everyone, thanks for joining. I got Corey here with me today. We're going to be talking about leveraging Giraffe for your FPA practice, but we're actually going to get into the weeds, right? We're just not going to be talking about the benefits, although this first video of this 10 video series is going to be a little bit about touching around some of the important things like product market fit mm -hmm. and this whole thing around blueprinting, right, Corey? And what that means and all through the lens of the practitioner. How do we approach it? How do we look at things differently than, say, the Giraffe Help Center that you may have seen already? Right. So we're going to be approaching this series, like Corey said, through the lens of the practitioner, helping you, the CPA, the fractional CFO, and even the bookkeeper and advisor, leveraging Giraffe, essentially replacing the dreaded spreadsheets. Giraffe is a great tool to help you, a practitioner, scale your FP&A practice. So, Corey, let's start with like point number one here, product market fit. What does that really mean in the context of FP&A and Giraffe for the practitioner? Yeah, you really can't just take a one-to-one -one model and put it into Giraffe. So, we start with product market fit. Do they have systems that integrate well into Giraffe? Things like QuickBooks, Zero, your typical mainstream general ledger accounts. And now why is that? I mean, what if I'm on QuickBooks desktop? Why can't I use Giraffe? It, it really comes down to the integration and the scalability of, of Giraffe, right? You're, you're trying to get away from spreadsheets. And frankly, Giraffe doesn't have a connection with right. QuickBooks desktop. So point number one here is when you're scaling your FP&A practice, leveraging a system like Giraffe is excellent because it helps you build scale and reduce quality issues, the dreaded rework that you get with spreadsheets, whether it's that searching for that needle in a haystack or around a formula, or worse yet, you're sending a customer a non-version controlled Excel spreadsheet, right? Yeah, you're not really building out your scalability if you're exporting from desktop to Excel into Giraffe. So if your customer's on QuickBooks or Xero, or even Gusto for the staffing module, which is a great tool because let's face it, 80% of most expenses for our startup friends are people, right? So the whole staffing module is a very important piece of the Giraffe ecosystem. And so part of the product market fit is also defining that cadence and rigor, and that has to start with accounting. Mm -hmm. So talk to us a little bit about the importance of making sure that a customer has a clean set of books before you even jump into draft. Yeah, it's important before you even jump in because if you have a chart of accounts that's a thousand line items long, once overkill. Again, overkill, but you're also you're not helping your scalability, right? So we're trying to look at this through the lens of the practitioner who's working on multiple models at the same time. And if you have a thousand chart of accounts, it's not scalable and it's also not worthwhile to model out you know, your telephone. Right, in expenses. other words, we're not gonna be looking at 13 week cash flows here, yeah. right? We're looking at annual operating plans, three to five year long range plans. So now the second piece to consider, and it's actually been a little bit of a savior for us, is this whole process called blueprinting. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that because the average practitioner is probably not gonna be getting a customer model de novo. Their chances are that you're gonna be getting a bicycle in motion. So you're gonna be taking this like spreadsheet with like 25 actual sheets inside yeah. this workbook and you're trying to like shove all of this into a giraffe. So talk to us a little bit about blueprint. Or even on top of that, another thing that we see a lot is you do have those Excels where you have those thousand chart of accounts that they have modeled out, right? And so we usually tack blueprinting as the first step in model building. That right. needs to come first. That's great. And so part of this video, we're actually going to transition over to Corey and he's actually going to walk us through a typical blueprinting for a sort of a below average, easier type of uh, customer model. Right, Corey? Yep. What we're about to go through is the blueprinting of a financial model before bringing it into Giraffe. What we're looking at right now is just the pro forma P&L of a standard templated model. Yours may look a little bit different, right, between your revenue categories as well as your operating expense or cost of goods categories. However, generally speaking, this methodology applies to any type of business model, whether that's retail, e-commerce, internet, SaaS, etc. I like to start with the P&L because that's kind of the basis of your giraffe model, right? So that's what drives the cash flow analysis. That's what drives, in many aspects, the balance sheet. And so I like to start with the P&L to get my team up and running. And what I'll usually do is I'll start with just creating a tab off to the left. 
this is going to be my blueprinting column. And in this column, this is going to be where all of your notes and instructions really lie. Sure, there's going to be more detail that comes behind the scenes, maybe conversations that need to be had, maybe more detailed notes, but generally speaking, this is the starting point. And as we kind of go down, I like to go from top to bottom, just starting with revenue. As we go down, we'll kind of outline how the model should be built, right? Whether that's a constant driver, whether that's a fixed spread, an annual target, a growth rate, a function of assumptions, etc. Let's start off at revenue at the top. If we actually dive into this model and we actually click into some of these sales, right? We can tell that commission sales come from the revenue source. Prepaid sales also come from the revenue source. Those are both tabs in this Excel file. And it looks like most of these revenue comes from that tab. So right now what we're gonna do is we're gonna just put it in a custom table. Because there's going to be more details behind the scenes, right? That's not just X times Y. We're gonna need some more detail. Maybe it's a working model, maybe it's some working papers around how we build up to that 71,000, scaling up to 600,000. And so for that, we're gonna use a custom table. We'll come back to that later. If we go down the tab, looks like commissions. Those are coming from revenue source too, but I know that those are just a function of the revenue, right? It's an assumption. And so what we're gonna do is that's going to be an assumption. And that's simply going to be using your assumption table times some of these revenue numbers, right? We don't have to go into much detail together on this blueprinting. I would advise against over detailing it out because things may change. And as you build it out and as you begin to process it into draft, you may find different ways that you can simplify the model, change it, uh, that make more sense, right? With the advanced functionality that you have that you probably didn't have in Excel. Some things down, SAS, once again, if we kind of peruse this equation, looks like they're leveraging a lot of assumptions with some H lookups to probably pull some of those specific assumptions. And so what we're gonna do, is we're gonna just go down to assumptions as well, right? I wouldn't over trivialize this. Uh, there's a lot of moving pieces to this, but we just wanna get the ball rolling so that we can pass it to our team so that they can begin processing it. And we'll blueprint not every single tab, but a, a good majority of them. G&A expenses, these all come from what's called op source. Once again, a different tab. So for now, we're gonna skip over these and let's hop over to the op source to give a little bit more detail. So we're looking at the op source and right here you can tell that we have the revenue reference and then we have your standard categories, right? Your G&A, your professional services, product development, HR and benefits, sales and marketing, data, et cetera, leading up to your total OPEX. Within each category, this is going to become a question. Once again, this is the purpose of blueprinting. How much detail do you want? This doesn't look like too many accounts, right? If your chart of accounts in your accounting system tie to this, great, that makes it a lot easier for you, but more times than not, it's not going to match. And so what we'll wanna do is consolidate a lot of this, right? Professional services, you probably don't need all eight of these accounts. Looks like legal services and expenses can be consolidated. Financial management, accounting, and bookkeeping can be consolidated. You can probably slim these down quite a bit. And let's just say that you do wanna keep these for whatever reason. We're gonna create that once again, that blueprinting column. And if we go down, I'm just gonna to stick to professional services for now. It looks like these are all just manually inputted, hard-coded numbers. And so for that, we'll have the option. Let's take a look at consulting. Consultant seems to be 3,000 every single month. So we'll set that as a constant. However, legal services, that seems to be bumping around a little bit. 6,000, 5, 10, 10, 10, 75, 5, right? It's kind of all over the map. I would not set a driver for that. I'd probably hard code that. Okay. And we'll kind of skip around a little bit because the, there's more than constants in hard coded. Consulting services, these do hop around a bit. Those are probably better to hard code actually. But let's take a look at something like the 401k or health and dental benefit. This is most likely a function of headcount. Even though we're looking at this as a hard coded number in the beginning, it does change over to an assumption based off headcount. So let's build that as an assumption. 401k, once again, it's an assumption of $5 per headcount. Payroll burden. 
eight and a half percent per salaries. I'm not going to go through all these accounts, but you'll get an idea of blueprinting just so that someone that's coming in that you're going to hand this blueprint to is able to get the ball rolling. They're not going to be able to finish every single piece of it, but they'll be able to start the process. And that's what we're looking for here. Great. Welcome back. So Corey, nice job. I get it. You no know, blueprinting to me is like triaging a model, right? Yeah. I know every time the average practitioner gets a model, you end up spending hours trying to dissect and break that model into its sort of lowest common denominators. Yeah. So talk to us a little bit about the benefits of this blueprinting. The benefits of the blueprinting really come down to helping you dissect from what you have into how the framework is going to be in Giraffe, right? It's not a one-to-one -one translation. You don't have the same tabs, right? Things are formatted differently. And so later in the series, we'll go into kind of how we've built out our fp &A team for scalability on Giraffe. And part of that is going to talk about analysts, right? It's the analysts actually building the models. And so blueprinting for us, a big piece of that is helping to translate what's in our head or the client's head into what's going to go into Giraffe and how it's going to go into Giraffe. So blueprinting, in other words, creates a common language for our analysts to take mm -hmm. the spreadsheet and put it into Giraffe. And, and I'll, I'll add one more thing to totally. it, is it sets expectations with the customer. Love right? it. Good. And so in the videos to come, we're going to be talking about things like navigating Giraffe, how we approach business modeling, the inner workings, the custom tables, all of these things that are, you know, nomenclature that you normally don't hear in the world of Excel. So I hope you enjoy this. And so with that, our series is going to be focused around the 10 steps to business modeling. It's on our website. I would actually recommend you jump onto our website and actually in the notes here, you'll also find it. It's a 10 steps to uh, business modeling. It's a great guide for the next 10 videos in this series. Thank you. That was great. So thanks for watching. Please subscribe. Leave us some feedback. Also check out our website, growthlabfinancial.com. Again, subscribe so you can be notified for the next one.